please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Jennifer Shays. Okay, well, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. So, um, I like to know to whom I'm speaking. So, uh, how many of you are um, engineers? Okay. How many of you are scientists? And of the scientists, biological, physical, social. Okay. Social science. Okay. Good. Um, and and how about literature? That's the one. Okay. <laughs> Good. Great. <laughs> Okay, so I know interdisciplinarity is not a word, but none of you are from English, that so doesn't matter. I'm going to be talking about what I call the age of networks. Um, so when we look around, we see networks. We see physical networks like the Internet, the World Wide Web, social networks. Uh, we see biological networks, resource allocation networks. So what I'm going to do is talk a little bit um, just tell you some of the networks that I'd like to try to model. Then I'll tell you some of the problems that I look at on networks. And then I'll focus, so this will be classes of problems, and then I'll focus on a couple of, um, a couple of specific problems. So, um, as I mentioned, I look at technological networks, at social networks, which can be technological social networks like Facebook, uh, economic networks, biological networks. So, I am a mathematician, or I think of myself as a mathematician, so uh, I view these networks as graphs, so they have vertices and they have edges. So the internet, the autonomous system internet, so an autonomous system is something like AOL or, uh, you know, Harvard.edu or NAS, those are, those, are, um, those are autonomous systems. So the vertices are those, and then the, uh, uh, the connections are the edges among those networks. The World Wide Web, the pages, I'm moving around a lot. Am I making it hard for you? I got this kind of no, jumping right. around so problem. What, what are the connections? So there are physical connections actually that connect these different systems. And there are actually different levels, and I'll mention a little bit of, of, of that. So on the World Wide Web, there are over a trillion static web pages. Okay, those, uh, a static web page is something that's there even without your doing something. When you put in a search term, you, get, you, you can get an entirely new web page that has never appeared before. But there are over a trillion static web pages. There are hyperlinks that take you from one, um, from one edge to, from, from one um, page to, uh, to a different page. There are things like cloud networks, data center networks. Those are really interesting, actually. Um, Right now, they uh, believe that about 3% of the U.S. energy use is through these networks. So you think you're doing a search and that it doesn't take any energy. That's not true. These, no, really, these data centers are going. It's about 3% of the energy use in this country, and it's doubling every five years. Okay, so we think about algorithms on these networks because if we don't do this much, um, much more efficiently than it's being done now, we're going to have to invade other planets to find enough oil for us to run our search engines. Okay, so there are offline social networks that people have been studying for years, like epidemiological networks. There are online social networks, like this young man here was telling me he likes Facebook, okay, Facebook, LinkedIn. The representations, the graphical representations of those networks are really, really interesting problems, how to represent that mathematically. There are things like mobile phone networks, which have been studied a great deal. Actually, all kinds of privacy violations even before the NSA stuff, some of the studies in Europe 
were able to, you were able to go back from the things that were on the web and figure out who had called whom, okay? Um, instant messaging networks, there have been a lot of studies of those. Twitter microblogging networks, I've actually worked with some of my grad students and postdocs writing papers on the mathematics of the way Twitter networks form. Okay, economic networks, so there are peering, uh, peering agreement networks. So on the AS internet, there are actually three tiers. Um, if you are on the top tier, you can send something to somebody else on the top tier without paying, or on any other tier, without paying anything. If you're on the second tier, you have to pay the top tier if you use the connections to the top tier. Otherwise, you, you, you don't. The third tier has to pay the second tier and the first tier. So there's all kinds of very strange routing and cryptographic problems based on the economic incentives caused by that design. Okay, there are market networks, you know, buyers and sellers and intermediaries and just bipartite graphs of buyers and sellers. And a lot of economists study this and a lot of computer scientists study this. There are biological networks like phylogenetic trees, okay? So we just look at what exists now and from that we try to infer what happened in the past. There are gene regulatory networks. So the genes, you know, DNA goes to RNA, goes to proteins. The proteins sit on the genes and affect the transcription. And these are fascinating networks, and I'll be talking more about these. There are real neural networks, which are going to be studied a great deal. We were just talking about the fact that it looks like uh, the Obama, um, the Obama brain, uh, brain Initiative will spend $3 billion over the next 10 years studying the brain, and the European Union is spending 3 billion euros over a period of about 10 years also. So there's going to be tremendous progress here, or at least a tremendous um, expenditure of money here. <laughs> okay. So what are the kinds of problems that we look at? Well, being a physicist, the first thing I do when I see something is I try to model it. I try to write down a mathematical model which contains just what is necessary and no more. Okay, Just what is necessary for the particular effect that I'm trying to describe and no more. They're sampling from large networks. How do we sample from them? We can't take in the whole network. How do we sample properly from it? There are processes that take place on these networks. We can devise algorithms on these networks. These two young guys should really think about doing that with their lives because there's so much you can do if you write algorithms for networks. And there are network reconstruction algorithms. Okay, so modeling networks. Well, if I'm going to model something, the first thing I have to figure out is what I want to model, what features I want to be able to um, to be able to describe. So one of the things about these networks that everyone is looking at these days is that they have small diameter. Okay, six degrees of separation. People say Stanley Milgram back in the 50s gave a postcard, you know, to somebody in the Midwest, and he said, "Okay, I want you to get this to." someone who has a particular name who's a teacher in some town in New England, in Massachusetts, okay? So I want you to think of an algorithm, a local algorithm, to send that to the person you think will be along the shortest path you can guess from you to them, okay? And typically they found it was about six hops. Um, there are recent studies on Facebook which show about five and a half hops from one person to another maximum diameter, maximum of five and a half hops. Actually, this goes back to 1929. There was a Hungarian author who wrote a story talking about the fact that all people are just six hops away from each other. So I'm not sure how he came up with that in Hungary in 1929. Um, power law. So, if I ask, what is the probability that I have k neighbors, okay, that falls off relatively slowly. It falls off like 1 over k to a power rather than exponentially in k, like a lot of 
things people used to study 20 years ago. Anything you studied fell off exponentially. Now, anything you study falls off like a power law. Okay, people say that power laws are the signature of human activity. Okay, then there's aging of vertices. That's something that I'd like to, um, um, to describe. So the longer a vertex has been in the network, the more highly connected it tends to be. Not absolutely, but high, with higher probability, it's more highly connected. And this is, in fact, used by web spammers. So, you know, you go to get a search result, and there are the organic, the non-paid search results in the main body of the page. Those are the ones you're supposed to be able to trust because, as I'll explain to you in a moment, those are based on, those are supposed to be based on just following the links that are on the web. Now, the thing is that um, search engine optimizers, they call themselves, are businesses that go in and put extra links to particular websites, trying to pull them up in that ranking. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about how the, the search engines work. So early search engines used content and language to find the most relevant web pages. Okay, so they indexed everything based on the language and the content. Later search engines use the structure of the web graph. So this is really graph theory and algorithms to find the most relevant web pages. They treat the web as a directed graph. Every hyperlink, link from one website to another, is something that you can take a step along if you're walking along this directed graph. So you do a random walk on this directed graph for a long, long time until you get to something called stationarity, okay, or get close to stationarity. Now, you could get stuck, okay? Let's say that one of you who was an academic posted your paper on your website and it had no outlinks. Then any time anyone stepped there, they're stuck because there are no outlinks. So every seven steps or so, you just take a random hop someplace so that you don't get stuck. The relative rank of your page in that distribution is the page rank of that page. To first approximation is just the number of inlinks. So if everybody's pointing to you, if you're you know, Justin Bieber and everybody's pointing to your web page, you have a high page rank. Okay, but web spammers use that to fool the search engines. So we actually came up with ranking algorithms that detect anomalies. So as you're doing it, if you run into something as, as you're doing the random walk, if you run into something that is anomalous, it automatically gets downgraded. So you don't have to explicitly have a human being go and pull that off, which is what Google was doing. They were pulling off the ones that they said were falsely being promoted. And then there were lawsuits and everything because these companies said, oh, our business was destroyed when Google pulled us off. Well, you don't have to do that. You can just have an algorithm go in there and automatically do that. And the legal profession believes that algorithms are completely neutral, which is, of course, ridiculous if you know how to write algorithms. But they believe that, and so you don't get into trouble doing that. OK, so I'm actually working with people now at Harvard Law on showing that algorithms are not really neutral, doing some theorems on that. But anyway. Okay, so the first model that people came up with, 1999, really simple model. At each time step, a new vertex is added, and it sends out links to m other vertices, let's say three other vertices, okay? And what is the probability that it's going to hit any given vertex? It's the number of connections that vertex already has. So it's a rich gets richer. You walk into a room and you say, who am I going to try to befriend? I'm going to try to befriend the person who's really, really popular. Okay, most of you probably didn't do that, which is why you became academics. But a lot of other people do that, and that's how you get these human kinds of graphs, okay? Um, which are very different than academic graphs where you've got these little clusters. Um, okay, and the first rigorous work on the model was one year later. There are other types of models, variants of preferential attachment. So you say not every website is born equal. Some are born 
fitter than others. And if they're born more fit, then um, there's going to be a higher probability that something attaches to it. So Google came along after the AltaVista website, but a lot more people linked to Google than linked to AltaVista because it was fitter. Turns out, and this made me very happy, that when you analyze that, you actually find phase transitions. And phase transitions make me happy because I study them a lot. OK, competition models. There are models in which the choice of the next vertex is determined by a competition of different factors. So which is the next vertex? You have a competition, and you choose on the basis of that competition. And we did work on this in, I don't know, eight and uh, four years ago. And we actually showed, this was, I think this was a PNAS cover. Um, we showed you got some interesting networks that looked like some biological networks. There are fully game theoretic models, strategic models. So there are all kinds of models. OK, another class of problems that one looks at is sampling. So the World Wide Web is very large, and it's growing. If I want to do something like calculate page rank, not a very hard algorithm. I take a random walk, and I keep walking and walking and walking until things don't change anymore. Okay. It doesn't sound like it's a very hard algorithm, but if I'm trying to do that on a trillion websites, it takes too long. So I want to sample. I want to just do that on a subset. Well, how do I know whether the subset that I'm dealing with is anything like a representative sample? OK, so being a physicist, I said, oh, there must be a limit, like a thermodynamic limit of a graph. OK? And so if I could just sample from something that looked like the limit, then I would be in good shape. And so we developed a theory of graph limits and testing over the last seven years or so, which now is a thriving field. But it was motivated by thinking about what is the limit of the web graph and what are limits of growing graphs in general. And you took certain graphs and you mapped them into certain kinds of matrices and you took limits of those matrices. and you had hundreds of pages of mathematics, which I'm not sure has much to do with the web anymore, but it's nice stuff. OK, so processes on networks. Flow of information is a process on a network. So the network in itself can be formed by a probabilistic process, like I told you, you know, come in and attach to three other sites based on how popular those sites are with a probability proportional to how popular they are. Um, so that's a probabilistic process which generates a network. But on top of the existing network, you can have a probabilistic process that describes something on the network, like the flow of information on the network. So John Kleinberg and many collaborators have done work on this. You can have spread of epidemics on networks. So you have a probabilistic process creating the network, but then you have a virus or a worm which spreads on the network probabilistically. And how does it behave given the structure of the underlying network? Turns out that on these preferential attachment networks, it behaves very differently. Epidemics take off extremely quickly on these networks, which is kind of disturbing because that's what human networks look like. So that's why people were so concerned about the SARS virus and anything that mutates rapidly on a preferential attachment network is going to be highly problematic. OK, there's viral marketing. When I go on a network, how do I identify the influential sites in that network, the sites such that if I introduce something at those sites, it would tend to spread? So if I was a hacker, trying to bring down a network, OK, or a viral marketer trying to go on Facebook and sell something, how would I figure out the sites that I want to attack so that something spreads? OK, algorithms on networks. So those are processes, OK? Those were like processes of natural or unnatural processes. Algorithms, well, we already learned about a class of algorithms for doing web search, for ranking one web page relative to the other. Just recently, I've been working with um, a grad student and some other people, like my husband, who's bored there. Um, uh, 
working on sublinear time page rank. So trying to do this in less than linear time in the number of sites on the network. Because when you have a trillion sites, you want less than linear. Okay. Um, clustering for collaborative filtering on bipartite graphs. So, you know, if you like this, you'll also like that. So Amazon does this for you, right? If you like this book, you're going to like that book. Netflix, I think Netflix does this brilliantly. I mean, I can't believe it. I like obscure movies and they just like, they nail it, you know, so often. No, they really do for me. I mean, I, I would never find these bizarre little foreign films, you know, and they just, but they really, it's a very, these are, these are interesting algorithms. And what they have to do with is they have to do with sparse graphs, okay? You don't have much in there. You have, you know, God knows how many thousands and thousands of movies. And I rank so few entries in this matrix. And what I'm trying to do is what's called a matrix completion problem. And people like Terry Tao, great mathematicians, work on these matrix completion problems that are closely related to things like the Netflix challenge, improve the Netflix algorithm. So it's really lovely, lovely mathematics. And it's also kind of cool that they can tell us what we might want to watch or what we might want to read. Okay, algorithms for multicasting. If I have something and I want to broadcast it to certain sites, what's the most efficient way of doing that through the network? That, something very similar to this, turns out to be very useful for computational biology also um, in trying to figure out how the network worked in computational biology, so doing an inverse version of it. Web hosting. Akamai is a company in Kendall Square formed by Tom Layton and an ex-student of his that was based on the fact that websites used to come down when too many people tried to pull content from them. So they mirrored the content at various places, but they didn't just mirror it randomly. They said, where should we mirror it in the world so that it is likely that whoever wants to pull from this is going to be able to do so without bringing down the, the network. Okay, these, are, these are actually very nice problems. The solutions are not that hard. They're kind of cool. There is, in algorithms on networks, there is a lot of low-hanging fruit. Lovely, lovely problems. OK, so fast, and again, sublinear um, algorithms we've just come up with with this same grad student, Mickey Bratbar. Um, who, so what, what you do is you want to figure out what are the influential sites. And if you want to do this on a very, very large network, you might want to do it quickly. And then um, algorithms for recommendation systems. So how do I take a network, like Facebook or something, and from that try to construct recommendations for me based on what my friends or colleagues like. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about that problem later in the talk. Okay, and then there are network reconstruction algorithms. So here, phylogenetic reconstruction. This is a huge area. People like Tandy Warner, a lot of people that work in this area where you look at the leaves and you try to reconstruct what the evolutionary path was most likely to have been. They also do this with things like the AIDS virus. When there was a dentist and AIDS was transmitted you know, at his office, they were able to trace the evolution of the AIDS virus back through there. Okay? Also, they use it for linguistic evolution reconstruction. I mean, none of these things are certain, but it, so you, you look back and you try to get maximum likelihood in reconstructing the, the network. There are gene regulatory networks. So we learn that you know, certain proteins are, uh, you know, certain um, DNA is transcribed when other DNA is transcribed. You know, certain genes are, are turned on when others are turned on and turned off when others are turned off under a variety of circumstances. Okay, so we're getting very indirect information, circumstantial evidence about the network. Lots of different pieces of circumstantial evidence. How do we put that circumstantial evidence together and say what is likely to be going on in the gene regulatory network, including the parts of it that we can't see? 
and then reconstruction of learning processes and systems of synapses. There are not that many organisms for which we know the, you know, the connectome, as they call it. I mean, C. elegans, we know it's 300 and some odd neurons. We know what all of them are, okay? So there, you can look at a little C. elegans, a little worm, and you can see how it reacts to different concentrations of chemicals, different light, and you can try to backtrack from that and infer what synapses were actually active in particular responses, okay? And as we map out more and more complex organisms, these problems are going to explode computationally. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit also about gene regulatory networks. Okay, so now a couple of specific problems. One for more of a social, I mean, you, you could call it computer algorithms, but you also could call it more of a social problem, and the other a biological problem. Okay, so recommendation systems on trust networks and reconstruction of gene regulatory networks. So recommendation systems on trust networks. Okay, from a social network, we can build a trust network by taking a subset of that network and designating it as something we trust. I mean, if you look at Facebook, you know, for me, Facebook is a superposition of a lot of different networks, okay? There's like <laughs> the creeps from high school who found me somehow, right? Um, there's my relatives, there are my colleagues, there are, you know, people I enjoy listening to music with, whatever. So there are these different groups, okay? And like, I don't want to ask my mother for a recommendation of a math book, you know, and, um, you know, and I don't want to ask my colleague how I'm going to deal with my cousin. Um, so, so I want to take some subset of my particular network and I want to designate it as a, as a network that I trust in some particular domain. So let's say, you know, um, among my friends, there were certain people who always seemed to recommend good theater to me, okay? So, so I designate that I trust these particular people where theater is concerned. Okay, and I put an arrow from me to them indicating that I trust them. They may not trust me, but I trust them where this is concerned. Okay, and then I'm going to assume each vertex is in one of three states. I first thought I should do, you know, like one of ten states or something, but my social science friends told me it never works. You just say up, down, or neutral because no one ever knows how up they are when they're up, okay? So you like it, you don't like it, or you have no opinion on it. So I've got this subset of my graph now, which is, you know, my uh, theater recommendation network. And, uh, and, and then, and so there are arrows, you know, I trust Jimmy and Jimmy trusts Sally and whatever. And then each person says, you know, I liked this production of Midsummer Night's Dream. I didn't like the production of Midsummer Night's Dream. I don't know. I haven't seen it or I have no opinion on it. Okay, one of three things. And what I want to do is I want to propagate this throughout the graph to get a recommendation for me on whether I'm going to like it or not. There are an infinite number of ways I could do that. I mean, as the graph gets larger and larger, uh, I could just take the majority of everybody. I mean, that would be pretty stupid because then I wouldn't be taking into account these arrows at all, but that would be an algorithm. I just take the majority, okay? So what, what am I going to do? How am I going to come up with an algorithm? Well, if I were Kenneth Arrow, then I would say I'm going to devise a set of axioms that the output of the recommendation system should obey, okay? So, for example, symmetry. If I flip all the I like it to I don't like it and all the I don't like it to I like it, then the sign of the recommendation should change. Anonymity, if I, I don't care if somebody's called Sally or somebody's called Jane, you know, if, if they sit in an isomorphic place in the same kind of place on my network, exactly the same place, it doesn't matter who they are. Okay, so that's a kind of symmetry thing. 
positive response. There are all, all kinds of very reasonable axioms. I mean, this really sounds arrow-esque, independence of irrelevant alternatives, blah, blah, blah. So I come up with six very reasonable axioms that, you know, if, if I explained it to you, you'd say, of course I want my recommendation system to obey this. It's very reasonable. And then you look really impressive because you prove an impossible an impossibility theorem which says that there does not exist a recommendation system which satisfies the previous six axioms. Unless you're a mathematician and you realize that when you add enough axioms, you come up with a contradiction. Okay, so I added enough axioms, I came up with a contradiction. That's what an impossibility theorem is. But the positive result is much more interesting. We removed any one of the six axioms and we actually constructed an algorithm which, whose output obeyed the other five axioms. And you can begin to think about this when you think about neutrality of axioms. So this is what I'm working with the people at the law school on, is that you, know, you, you can start to put on certain kinds of axioms, axioms that, have, that are related to privacy, axioms that are related to anonymity. You can't enforce all of them simultaneously. And there are choices that one has to make to see, do I have a mutually satisfiable set of axioms. And that's about as neutral as your algorithm can get. So, and I've even talked to people at Bing about using algorithms like this to monetize social networks. So, you know, you take your mobile phone and you have your social network and it'll tell you, oh yes, go to this restaurant. This is what your people recommend for you. So, very, very different set of problems. Reconstruction of gene regulatory networks. So standard dogma, lots of asterisks all over here. I mean, no epigenetics here or anything like that. Just DNA goes to RNA, goes to proteins. Okay, transcribe, transcribe. And then the proteins come back and they sit on portions of the DNA and they cause it to be transcribed more or transcribed less. And you know, that's why you can have these cells that first approximation all contain the same DNA and whoa, they're doing really different things, okay? And so you get this feedback process, right? That causes different cells to be doing different things and developing in different ways. You've got a protein interactome. So problems, of course, with the gene regulatory networks are you know, obviously the sources of many, um, of many diseases. So can we infer network structure from partial data? Okay, we know something's going wrong. We see some output. Can we infer something about the parts of the network that we're not seeing? And in particular, can we identify particular nodes on the network which might be really crucial in the dysfunction so that we can alter those nodes in some way and alter the outcome of, of the disease? Okay, so. And then are one or more of these nodes in combination viable drug targets? Okay, so drug discovery paradigm, lots of input. You know, here are the microarrays, but lots of kinds of input. We do some computational models, and we get possible points of intervention, you know, and that's the beginning of then this long, long process that, you know, I don't know, one in a thousand of them might make it past, past that, that point. Okay, so gene expression data. Well, micro, microarrays tell us which gene is expressed in the presence of another gene under a particular set of conditions. So I do this for one set of conditions, and then I alter the conditions, and I get another snapshot, and I alter the conditions, and I get another snapshot. So I'm getting all this information about what's going on under different circumstances. Okay, so <clears throat> what happens is if a particular gene in a particular circumstance is expressed much more or much less than background, I say, huh, that gene probably has something to do with this pathway because it's under or overexpressed. And so that'll tell me something about a node weight. To get edge weights in my network, I'm just gonna say, you know, let me put in all the information I have about a particular organism. This particular organism, let's say yeast, pretty simple organism, it's believed that protein A interacts directly with protein B somewhere, you know. And so I'm gonna put in an, an, an edge to, to indicate that. 
And so I used these edges and these nodes and I tried to determine something about the network. So I do this as a math problem. I have a graph. I have some costs on edges that are going to be telling me something about the organism. And I have some set of terminals, I call them. These are the nodes, the genes that I think really ought to be in my pathway. Okay? And the problem, the mathematical problem in this idealization is that I want to find a tree which connects all of these particular nodes that better be in there. There are going to be other ones that are necessary to connect the whole thing into one connected component and minimize this cost. So the cost is going to have to do inversely with how much I think the proteins interact with each other. Okay. And the additional nodes, the nodes that land up showing up that I didn't put in there are called Steiner nodes. And they're called Steiner nodes because there was a guy named Steiner <laughs> who, um, it comes from at t actually. It's really interesting. So, uh, do I have a, okay, really, really easy. at t used to charge by how much it costs to lay the wire to connect things, okay? So I have these three, and they were going to charge some company to, connect these three dots together, okay? And they were going to charge this much, this plus this plus this. Okay, but what if instead I put an extra node that wasn't in my network that I don't care about connecting right in the middle there, and then I did this. Then everything is connected, and the sum of those three lines obviously, <laughs> is less, because every black line is shorter than a red line, is less. So this is the Steiner node. I stick it and it's not supposed to be there. But the solution that uses that extra node is cheaper. Okay? So that's what those additional nodes are. And actually, somebody was able to pay at t less money for that reason. Okay, so computational issue, we came up with a new algorithm which takes the connectivity, which is a global constraint, and expresses it locally in such a way that we were able to construct a local parallel, very fast algorithm to do this. Okay, so now the biological problem. So now, instead of terminals that must be in there, I'm going to say, okay, it doesn't have to be in there, but I'll give you a big prize if you put it in there, okay? So for something that's overexpressed or underexpressed, really a lot, I'll give you a huge prize. Overexpressed or underexpressed, a little bit, I'll give you some prize. Not overexpressed or underexpressed at all, no prize, okay? And so I have this cost, and if I take that lambda to infinity, it's just your old Steiner tree problem. But now instead of saying it must be in there, I'm saying, I'm going to give you a prize if you put it in there. Okay, that's, that's all that's saying. So mapping the biological data, the edges tell me about the probability that an edge is known. Nothing is ever known in biology like this. But, you know, the people really believe that protein I interacts directly with protein J. Okay? In the given organism. In some, some place they've measured it and all that they know about the, the organism. And then these prizes tell me I get a bigger prize if the gene is underexpressed or overexpressed in this particular realization. Okay, then what are Steiner nodes here? These are nodes that are not in the set, but that I put in to get a, a better solution. So now, if I don't just say it needs to be in there or it doesn't need to be in there, but I'll give you a bigger prize if you put it in there. Then, well, you know, if I land up including a really little one, like this one, hey, there's no reason to include this guy. He's really little. Why should I do that? Well, I do that because he manages to connect me with these, with these ones that have big prizes. Okay? So I call that a, a Steiner node. And what are these going to be in the biological network? These are going to be things which are neither underexpressed nor overexpressed very much at all. So they look like, ah, oh, this gene is just sitting around being transcribed at background level. So I don't think it has anything to do with what's going on. But somehow in the solution I come up with, it looks really important. 
So maybe just sitting at background level, it's actually important. Okay? It doesn't underexpress or overexpress, but it's important. So that could be a drug target. Okay, so we did this for the yeast pheromone response pathway. We did this for yeast because yeast is super well characterized and because we were just physicists and mathematicians and you can just look up all the data on yeast and you don't have to get a biologist to believe that you know what you're doing. And um, so, you know, there's this many proteins, like about 5,000 proteins, about 15,000 known protein-protein interactions. <clears throat> We were able to just go online and get 56 large scale, so 56 different experiments about this gene is underexpressed or overexpressed relative to that gene. Set of prizes, constructed 56 solutions of this problem, superimposed them to get one network. Okay, so there is the network that we got. Two types of proteins were on the network. Proteins that were differentially expressed, and so of course we're not surprised they showed up on the network. But then proteins that were not differentially expressed but seemed to bridge from one part of the network to the other, like that one there. Okay? So are those important in the pathway? So then, and this is why it took so long, we were still just physicists and mathematicians and we had to get a biologist to believe us. And so we, you know, went knocking on a lot of doors and finally we got a biologist, a team of biologists who were able to knock out the corresponding gene, which turned out to be really hard to do because it was right at the end of the chromosome and everything kept unraveling. But anyway, what happened was the pathway fell apart. So it was kind of experimental proof. So, okay, so we did this on yeast. Very, very nice. But really, who cares about yeast? <clears throat> so from yeast to mammals, we think big. Okay, so mammals, incomplete interactome data. 10 times as many transcription factors, huge intergenetic regions, the computational problems are exploding exponentially, but we have this very clever, highly distributed algorithm, okay? So, and we chose to look at glioblastoma. It's very well characterized, and my uncle, whom I loved, died two years ago of it, and so we chose to look at this, and it's the human cancer, you know, the kind of well-known one with the worst outcome. I mean, you just, you, if you do everything, you die in a year. Um, and it's much more common in men than in women. Okay, so can we find glioblastoma pathways using our prize collecting Steiner tree? And so we also worked with the Frankel lab at MIT, um, who had been using a different kind of algorithm in yeast for similar things, but the LP algorithms didn't scale, but our algorithms did. They scaled to human data. So how did we choose the root of the Steiner tree. Well, we said, let's choose a receptor protein since these are often the beginning of the signaling pathways. So EGFR is something that you hear a lot about in many human cancers, EGFR is messed up. So in some like 60% or something of the glioblastomas, it has a mutant of the EGFR. Okay, so we said, okay, we want EGFR to be the root. We want that to be in every, in you know, in every tree that we construct, and you tend to choose a receptor protein because you believe a pathway will extend from a receptor protein. So this was the resulting pathway. So if you start to look at it, and the, and the, the color has to do with what a big prize you got. So we gave a huge prize for EGFR, but other ones got big prizes. How big it was didn't come out of the data, but came out of the mapping. It's how central it was. That's how we made the dots bigger or smaller. So you begin to look at it and you say, hey, this network that we get makes a lot of sense. There are lots of things here that are known to be associated with DNA repair and all kinds of things where, you know, I know that they don't do very well, that if there's a mutation there, it's going to create a problem. But like, what was this, okay? This is very, very central. It has no prize. What is it doing? Okay, so let's identify interesting Steiner nodes. Top five nodes net ranked by in between the centrality, so how central they were to the network we found. So the first one was well known to be active in many types of cancer, had a relatively large prize. The next one, it had no prize, not previously identified for glioblastoma. So what is it? It's the estrogen receptor. 
So this was the first pathway link between glioblastoma and gender, okay? I mean, somehow the estrogen receptor was really important in this pathway, just very central in this pathway. Okay, the experimental test, if we put in estradiol, which is basically estrogen together with the EGFR inhibitor into culture, it inhibited the growth of glioblastoma. Now, that's a long way from, you know, pumping estrogen into someone's brain. I mean, there's this blood-brain barrier and all kinds of things. So drug therapy, I don't know, but it begins to give you, I mean, then maybe you work with some clever nanochemist who can deliver anything. Um, so, and then we started doing multiple singling, signaling pathways. So we had forests instead of trees. So basically we put in an artificial node which broke up and we got many trees. We were able to go, so you, you have parallel working pathways that come out of this. So we were able to go back to the yeast and see that there were actually lots of parallel pathways going on. We were able to go back to glioblastoma and see that there were lots of parallel pathways that were operating. Okay, and now we're actually, and I don't have it in here, but now we're actually working on breast cancer and we're coming up with methods to use this so that we can construct forests for each individual patient and then use information from pooling the patients to increase or decrease the prizes for particular proteins, which then allows us to generalize information across the, the whole population, but still in the end come up with very specific and very different pathways from patient to patient, but informed by what's going on with the other patients. So um, my postdoc is submitting that by midnight, <laughs> actually. <laughs> um, and he's great, and he's gonna be looking for a job in a year, okay. <laughs> So everywhere we look, we see large-scale networks, technological, social, economic, biological. The modeling of these networks, and this is why I was telling these guys, do your math, okay? It uses graph theory, combinatorics, probability, game theory, algorithms, okay? And, you know, whether it's in the domain of biology or social networks, technology, or you know, trying to do um, uh, uh, conserving of energy in, in data center networks. They all use very similar mathematics. The results are new theories, new theorems, new experimental predictions, even new business models, and possibly new drug therapies. 